The first film was shown in Paris in 1895 by the Lumiere brothers. Um, and then I saw the same year in New York by Edison. Edison had shown a film the year before, but it was only available to one viewer at a time. 1895 was the time when film was available to a larger audience than one. Uh, the first uh, film using film reel on cameras was um, the uh, arrival of a train by the Lumiere brothers. They were what was referred to as actualities. They tended to show actual events happening. So a very famous one was the Lumiere brothers was showed their factory in Lyon with the gates opening as the workers went out for lunch and the simple narrative finished with the gates closing. That was shown, a number of other uh, things, so, so, such as rail, uh, trains arriving at railway stations, events that showed what modern life was like. Photography in the early part of the 19th century for the first time presented images that could be captured so that the, you could, particularly when you got onto negatives, you could keep an image. Prior to that you had what was called a camera obscura where you could get the shadows but actually fixing it was difficult. So once you've got the de development of photography and the, and the techniques to be able to keep an image, that was one thing. But then with the, with the illusion of movement that the film camera gave, it allowed you to get that sense of an, a continuing story or to seeing things in movement. So you had photographers like Edward Mirebridge in Britain who showed how people's bodies moved, how animal bodies moved, and this was a revelation for people. And it was also used sort of scientifically as well, because, for instance, they with horses, they got a sense how horses movement when they cantered, that actually they kicked off on their back legs and moved diagonally. So it was used both sort of scientifically and, and to positively prove movement, but it was also used for entertainment and for other purposes. If you look at it today, um, you could look at the use of, say, digital SLRs um, to kind of shoot video on, a photography piece of kit essentially, shooting video. Film evolving out of theatre, if you look at a lot of the techniques of film, especially in fiction production, where you've got things like the 180 degree rule, um, it essentially comes from the theatre, you know, the fourth wall is the audience. Um, you could look at it like that. Theatre was one of the art forms that, um, that, that really sort of predated cinema, but actually quite central to it, in as much as we've always retained the proscenium arch. When you go into a cinema, the screen's ahead of you. So it, it apes that sort of the architecture of what the theatre was like. Um, and so that's continued really ever, ever since. The colour film started pretty soon after the origins of film. Um, and I think in 1902 you get, um, it was patented, but it was mainly done through people painting on each plate. So each individual image would be hand painted. And it was some time afterwards that you start to get f colour film stock. Um, I mean, obviously it was very incredibly um, time consuming for these artisans to have to paint individual frames. And there are historians who are investigating the importance of colour from, from the very first days. The first one that was shot and then given a colour, like a kind of colour to added to it um, in its processing was a film called Our King and Queen Through India, developed by the British. I mean, I think it's, it's a very big question and it's a big aspect of the philosophy of film. So even from the very early days you get sort of two branches, you get theoreticians that say, like André Bazin in France, that what film does is record reality. So that's what makes it unique and so it's that, that sort of documentary mode that's important to them. But on the other hand you get people say like Sergei Eisenstein in the Soviet Union who argue that, that the film does something different, that you can, particularly through editing through montage, you can sort of present a different view of the world. So I think those two very opposing views have all have sort of run through filmmaking and theoretical approaches to it. I mean, I suppose, I don't know if it's technological or not, but I suppose one of the, f I mean, the early films were 52 seconds worth of a camera that was in a fixed position. Um, so I think when filmmakers started to realise about moving the camera and how you can edit, that enabled 
narrative, in a sense, to develop. But that's not the only way it could have gone, but that is the way that was, it predominantly has gone. Then you've got um, the advent of recording sound to go with a film and being played at the same time. With the development of sound coming in in 1927 had a huge impact. There were a lot of people at the time who would have preferred it to stay silent and the film industry itself was reluctant to go into sound because of the costs and they didn't think it added to the medium but that was enormous. Colour stock. I think digital technology is, is enormous and you know, we're cusp of that now. We're just investigating what we can do with it. So that opens up whole new possibilities for, for film where it might and where it might go. So that's very important. I think when you speak to people who are used to colour film, black and white can seem quite alien. And actually, you almost have to develop a different mode of viewing to accept it. So I mean, if I show black and white films in class, sometimes students will say, oh, this is really boring, it's really dull, or whatever. So I think it's a generational thing. Um, I mean, there is this view, Roland Barthes, the French writer and critic, talked about that the, the filmic is only ever in the, in the black and white still, which seems a paradoxical statement, but it's the fact within that there is something quite special. So I think it's a generational thing. I think if you're used to colour, I think people expect things to be in colour, and it seems quite odd. So you'd have to, have to sort of get used to a different mode of address, I think. Um, so... You know, some people are perhaps more settled with black and white films than others. People's reactions to film when it was first developed in the 80s or 90s, if you look at that early uh, Lumiere mm. film, The Rival of a Train, it said that people in the audience ran out of the way because they thought the train was going to come through the screen that it was being projected onto. Um, that says it all to me. I think it was an ast astonishment, a shock, it was amazement, you know, that you could actually see this and that relationship between them and their lives and these things presented on screen. Um, and I think perhaps also the fact that you started to see these things with other people, whereas before you'd had to go up to a device where one person at a time looked through, suddenly you were with others, so that experience as an audience came together so I mean it's very hard isn't it I think to recreate just how amazing it must have been you've never seen that and you, you know, in the midst of Paris or New York you see these incredible images on a large screen in the dark coming at you it was absolute amazement look at it now the development of it it's amazing how you can connect with something on screen emotionally um, and be taken in taken in by it the Development and the technology of film, yeah, expensive. If you look at um, people who funded the developments of colour, people like people like um, Technicolor, and uh, there's another British um, pair that kind of uh, developed colour processing that were patented by them. They had backers, like big backers. You look at other types of equipment and things like that. Um, it is expensive, but that was then um, delivered to the masses in various forms various ways early on and throughout the rest of the time so that everybody can afford to go and watch the cinema therefore you can make more and more money. It's very early days a lot of companies who uh, were photographers did buy equipment to be able to, to make moving films and so there was a company in Sheffield, Sheffield Photographic Company in Norfolk Row who developed out of the theatre themselves. They took photographs and they also created short films so it was available for, for companies like that at not too expensive a price and they started making films and included, they made one film in 1903, A Daring Daylight Robbery, which became, uh, it was seen by Edwin Porter in America that year um, and it became The Great Train Robbery, which was the start of the chase genre. But for companies like um, Sheffield Photo Company, they lost out on distribution deal, so they lost money. But in the beginning, they had the ability to make a film that could be shown in Britain and America. But pretty soon, the film industry came into being. And you know, by about 1915, you start to have the studios, and they had greater wealth and greater power. I mean, the only other thing to say about the technology is the impact of digital technology, how that has made things now. You know, you can go and buy a very good quality camera, not too expensive, sort of things we have here. You know, you can make some fantastic films on, you can edit on a laptop. And so the, 
possibility, potential for young filmmakers or people wanting to make films is now excellent and opens up whole new opportunities. Let me be.